and welcome to the Fire in the Landscape Forum. My name is Tanya Ha. I'm a sustainability researcher and an environmental journalist, and I'm delighted to be your host for this forum. The Fire in the Landscape Forum is part of a suite of online forums that are being held as part of the Bushfire CRC Research to Drive Change project. Now for a brief overview of today's forum, the focus is on the impacts of bushfires on ecosystems, namely water flows and quality, carbon pools and combustion products. We'll soon start with an introductory video followed by three research presentations and some discussion with a lead end user. Along the way there'll be online polls and opportunities for questions and discussion. Now some of you are new to this online platform so I'll introduce you to the environment that you find yourself in. It's fairly self-explanatory. The centre centre panel that you see there is where we'll present the slides and the videos. The right-hand column that you see on your screen is where you'll see the presenters via webcam. But importantly, I'd like to direct your attention to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen where we have a dialogue box. You'll see it there with a talking balloon in its top left-hand corner. And this is the place that you can type your comments and questions as we move through today's proceedings. Note that our voices are coming through phone lines, but the vision is coming by the internet. Now we do this for optimal clarity but without taking too much bandwidth, but it does mean that there can be a little bit of a time delay between what you see and what you hear. We apologise for that, but we think it's the best that we can do with the available technology at the moment. Now if anyone is experiencing technical difficulties, you can contact the hotline on 1800 733 416 and tech support will assist you. Now that number again is 1800 733 416. One other minor note is we have found that the Bushfire CRC website has been offline a bit today. We're working to get that back online as soon as possible. Finally, the forum will be recorded and it will be available from the website at a later date. So if you do have colleagues that you think would benefit from the research that you hear today, do let them know. And incidentally, our last Research to Drive Change Forum, which was on the community understanding of fire risks from living in urban-rural interfaces, that is now available online. Now thank you to the people who have sent through some questions already. They'll be addressed during today's proceedings. And we'd also like to welcome several international visitors that we have joining us online today. I believe we have participants that are viewing from Brazil and Italy. So welcome and we'll try not to sound too Australian with our accents. Now it gives me great pleasure to let you know who you'll be hearing from today. We're going to have presentations from Dr. Taryn Turnbull from the University of Sydney, Dr. Petter Nyman from the University of Melbourne, Dr. Chris Weston from the University of Melbourne who will be joined for questions and answers by his colleague Dr. Luba Volkova. And finally we'll hear from a lead end user, Dr. Adam Leesley from ACT Parks and Conservation Service. But to kick things off, we're going to start with an online poll. How much do you think you understand about the impact of fire on water and carbon? Do you feel you know nothing, a little, a fair bit? or a lot. Click on the poll and let us know what you think your knowledge level is at right now. And we'll give it a few more seconds. And we'll leave it there. So it's good to see that you feel that you know a little, no one said nothing, which it's always good to have a, a basic understanding. And we hope that by the end of today's proceedings you'll have a, a more solid understanding of not just the research but what you might go to for more information at a later date. Now before we start off hearing the presentations, we're going to have a short video that's been produced by the Bushfire CRC. This will introduce you to today's subject matter and the people we'll be hearing from later. To me, the research that we've undertaken in this program and in other programs is about looking forward. It's about looking at where the industry is going to be in 10 years, in 20 years, and what are the challenges we're going to have in those 10 and 20 years. We were trying to gain a, 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 
some information that we could use to underpin our practices. So information that when we were burning, is that affecting water quality and quantity or not? Or are there ways of implementing that prescribed burning in a way that minimises the impact on water quality and water quantity? And in the same way with carbon, you know, how, how is our burning affecting plant growth? How is it affecting the atmosphere? Um, are there ways or things that we can do to lessen that or minimise that? One thing we wanted to look at was how changes in fuel moisture content not only affect flammability of the fuel, but how products from burning that fuel, the smoke products, are actually formed. If you're applying energy to a fuel to try and get it to burn, if there's a lot of moisture, a lot of that energy is going to be used to try and drive the moisture out, to basically evaporate it. By doing so, there's less energy available to drive combustion. So rather than driving sort of complete combustion, which is turning the fuel basically into carbon dioxide and water, there's not enough energy to drive that process all the way through. So what you end up is with less oxidised products like carbon monoxide, more volatile organic compounds, or even the production of more particulate matter, because you're not burning everything completely through to carbon dioxide or water. We know now if they're burning when it's drier, they're actually get more carbon dioxide relative to say carbon monoxide and the amount of volatile organic compounds and they're the compounds that very often lead to the formation of ozone. The project I was looking at um, was looking at how much water is used by a forest in a catchment. It's important to know because most of the um, catchments in southeast Australia are forested. 50% of them are alpine ash and the other 50% are mixed species forests. We know how alpine ash and mountain ash respond to fire. There's really lots of research in that area to show that yields of um, water entering the catchment are reduced for a prolonged period after a fire. But for mixed species forests, there was almost no data. We didn't know how the canopy reacted to fire. We didn't know how much water um, moved through the canopy. We selected paired, burnt and unburnt forests and um, went out for three years in a row to try and capture just different elements of canopy biology as it um, regenerated from the fire. So the important finding we had from our measurements of sap flow in the burnt and unburnt forests was that a tree that's regenerating after the fire by McCormick branches uses no more water than the unburnt counterpart. For example with fire, in an ash type forest if you have a, a crown removing fire, that water that's sucked up by the regenerating seedlings takes out about 100 years worth of reduced yield for the catchment. Whereas in a mixed species forest we think because the trees are already constrained by their root architecture, they aren't going to use more water as they regenerate. They're just going to construct a canopy that's already dependent on the architecture that they have below. From that um, particular piece of work, we've now got something that land managers can use with just an Excel spreadsheet to um, quantify how much tree water use will be happening in a particular forest type. Fire impacts on both the, the quality of water and the, the quantity of water from catchments. Our work is, is focused on trying to better understand uh, the risks to water quality and ways to reduce those uh, negative impacts on water quality and water supply after fire. The research involved a combination of both modelling and field experimentation. The modelling was focused on trying to understand the, the risk or predicting the likelihood of these kind of contamination events, whereas the uh, field work was focusing on the processes, the erosion processes, and we used that to try and pinpoint which uh, catchments and which parts of the landscape are most at risk of contaminating water supplies. The most important finding from the research is that um, post-fire water quality impacts in, in this part of the world predominantly result from this, this little known process called post-fire debris flows. Debris flows uh, result from very intense thunderstorms and a very unusual process because of the, the large magnitude and they uh, result in very large quantities of sediment and nutrients being delivered to, to rivers and reservoirs very quickly. Since undertaking the research our focus has really shifted to uh, where these processes can occur and the magnitude of them. So we're able to now kind of pinpoint 
catchments that are particularly at risk, so ones where you want to, might want to manage your plant burning better, or you might want to be ready with um, uh, you know, alternative water supplies after a wildfire, for example. It's increasingly important for land managers to be able to justify through the peer-reviewed literature to be able to point to evidence and have an evidence based for land management's decisions uh, in uh, knowing the outcomes or predicting the outcomes of uh, forest burning on, on carbon. One of the reasons that uh, researchers here at the University of Melbourne were drawn into this project is because of our expertise in forest biomass calculations and measurements and we teamed up with some of the operational level fire managers to look at before and after impacts of burning on forest carbon and we used our existing skills and expertise in measuring forest carbon to measure the outcomes of fire. Prior to our project we had some fragmented knowledge about carbon stored in litre uh, and trees, but we really didn't have much of a knowledge of, about carbon stored in green vegetation and be coarse woody debris, thin sticks and dead wood. One of the unexpected outcomes was the extent to which the larger pieces of fuel, coarse woody debris and standing dead trees, contribute to carbon losses because they burn for longer than the fine fuels, often for hours uh, and days, sometimes even weeks, and the greenhouse gas releases from these fuels tends more to the methane end of the spectrum. Methane has a strong global warming potential, 21 times that of CO2, and therefore it's important for us to, uh, to know the impact of fuel reduction burning on these heavier fuels as well. As well as being relevant to land managers making decisions about uh, fuel reduction burning on forest carbon, our results inform the National Carbon Accounting Initiative to better estimate uh, emissions from forest fires at a national level. I suppose the exciting thing for me that drives me is that we're learning from this as land managers and being better land managers. You know, admitting we don't know everything and what we've got to do is more research to underpin what we're doing, change our practices if needed or reinforce the practices that we're doing. And thank you to the Bushfire CRC for that video. It can be viewed online via the Bushfire CRC website when it's back online or also via YouTube in that link that I just went through. But for anyone who did have trouble hearing that video, um, then I'll give you a quick overview of what it covered. It, it looked at a discussion of how prescribed burning and wild bushfire affect water quality and quantity. And in the case of carbon, how burning affects plant growth and carbon and smoke products in the atmosphere. Importantly, some of the researchers also considered different forest types, mountain ash for example, compared with mixed species forests. Again, that, that video can be viewed online if you had any trouble viewing it. It now gives me my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, or the first presenter, which is Dr. Taryn Turnbull from the University of Sydney. Taryn's going to be talking about um, fires and the hydrology of southeastern Australian mixed species forests. And again, for the audience, we encourage you to send through your comments and questions via that dialogue box that we have at the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Take it away, Taryn. Excellent. Thank you, Tanya. So, oh, sorry. I've immediately gone too far. In Australia, anywhere between 50 to 90% of water to fall on a catchment will be transpired back to the atmosphere by eucalypt. Our catchments are vegetated with two main forest types. We've got ash forests and mixed species forests. The hydrology of the ash type forests is much better known. Um, for example, we didn't know much about the patterns in tree water use after fire in re-sprouting mixed species forests or the biology of the canopy in that forest type as it regenerated after a fire. For this project, we had four aims. We were going to determine the patterns of water use in mixed species forests as they regrow after fire, characterise the canopy biology during that period of regeneration, test existing models for predicting tree water use in this forest type, and develop a simplified model that would enable agencies to estimate tree water use. Mm -hmm. 
As catchment yield is strongly dependent on the capacity for trees to use water, catchment yield is vulnerable to any event that modifies the structure or the biological processes in a canopy, such as fire. Catchment yields are rapidly decreased after fire in ash type forests. So within the first seven years after a fire, catchment yields are 50% below what they would have been before. And these reduced yields persist for decades. The mechanism in that forest type is well understood. Ash type forests proliferate, um, sorry, they regenerate prolifically after a fire from seed. And the seedling dense regrowth has a much greater proportion of sapwood, and that's the, the tissue that conducts water, than its mature counterpart. Additionally, leaves on young um, eucalypts are also different to those on mature eucalypts. They have this leaf form called juvenile, and their juvenile leaves are predisposed to greater rates of water loss. But mixed species forests regenerate differently than ash type forests after a fire. They can also regenerate by seed, but they also regenerate quite often by release of epicormic buds that are located along the entire length of the tree bowl. The impact of that life history strategy that is regenerating um, by epicomic sprouting on catchment yields was undocumented before our project. So our research uses a variety of approaches to investigate the key components of um, canopy biology, and that's the primary driver of tree water use, which we call transpiration. So for the first three years after the 2009 Black Saturday fires, we conducted month-long campaigns in April. So that was April of 2010, 2011, 2012 as well, in a burnt area in northeast Victoria near Beechworth. For the two most prevalent eucalypts in that forest type, we quantified canopy leaf area and patterns of leaf distribution, leaf gas exchange within the canopy, um, and that was gas exchange of water and carbon, and also structural constraints to leaf water loss. And even though I'm terrified of heights, we still managed to do a decent job. So leaves are sprouting on epicomic branches are initially of the same juvenile form as those that we talked about from regenerating ash type seedlings. But leaves on um, epicormic branches revert to adult form much more quickly than those in seedlings. So you can see this transition um, in between 2010 and 2011 on our data set. That's the two clumpings of um, groupings on the insect graph there. All five anatomical features we measured on leaves um, as they resprouted from fire were consistent in showing this trend. So they differed structurally and they also differed physiologically. The leaves produced one year after fire were energetically less self-sufficient. So they had a reduced capacity to photosynthesize but they also had a greater rate of carbon lost by the process of respiration. We used isotope analyses coupled with these measurements to investigate whether leaves on resprouting epicormic branches differed in their capacity to lose water as the canopy reinstated. And you can see by the graph that um, Delta 13C, and that's the graph on the right hand side, um, was unchanged for that period, three periods after, sorry, three years after the fire. So what we can say from that is that um, the relationship between photosynthesis and the capacity for a leaf to use, lose water was constant. So we can assume that the leaves that sprouted immediately after the fire actually had a reduced capacity for water loss because they had a reduced capacity for photosynthesis. The second part of our project, sorry, was to um, compare those findings to what we see in a mature, unburnt mixed species forest. So to answer this question, we set up a second experiment to quantify tree water use in mixed species forests that were also burnt during the Black Saturday fires. And we compared those burnt fire, um, forests against their adjacent mature forest that was unburnt. So as briefly discussed before, tree water use depends on the prevalence of sapwood. And you can see that as the red part of those bands around the trees on the left hand side of the um, slide there. The speed of sap flow, which we measure using a um, sap flow probe, which is in the top right hand corner. The leafiness of a forest, and you can see an unburnt mixed species forest on the right panel down the bottom, and a burnt mixed species forest in the middle panel, and the evaporative demand of the atmosphere, and we measure that using um, the micrometeorological station that was also shown there. So we quantified sap flow between 2011 and 2012, July to July for both the years. Evaporative demand, which is the main control of tree water use, was greater in the unburnt mature forest and soils were wetter in the burnt regrowth forest. But overall, rates of tree water use were very similar in the burnt regrowth forest to the unburnt mature forest. This clear difference in tree water use between resprouting mixed species forests and ash type seedlings results from three factors we found. 
there was little increase in sapwood area in species that belong in regenerating mixed species forests. So they only had a 20% increase in sapwood area compared to a 70% increase, which happens in ash type eucalypts. Um, there was a decrease in leaf area after fire in mixed species forests, whereas it normally increases in ash type forests where it's regenerating by seedlings. And we also documented a slower sap flow in regenerating mixed species forests, whereas it's unaffected by fire in um, ash type forests. So the next thing we had to do was to model our findings. First, we tested a well-known model, SPA, which is a process-based model that simulates processes between soils, plants and atmosphere, including evapotranspiration, soil energy fluxes and growth primary production. The scale of parameterization of that model is at the leaf level, whereas it predicts tree water use at the canopy level. So its main benefit is that it allows for scaling up processes. We found it was able to predict stand transpiration in these mixed species forests but it was still limited use for agencies that manage forest for catchment yield. It requires 20 separate inputs to parameterize it, and a lot of them are quite um, labor intensive. It would be a very expensive exercise to parameterize forest water use um, using that particular model. So we set about making our own. Sorry. Um, we developed a model of tree water use that was based on the influence of light and evaporative demand, which are two environmental variables easily obtained by the public, on stomatal conductance. The model we made accounted for 89% of the variation in tree water use, and it just requires a brief period of training, which can be no more than one month of um, installation with SAP flow sensors for a particular forest type. We've already instrumented it in four main forest types within the catchment, so we're pretty confident that it's robust. Um, for these ones. The main research outcomes we had was that fire is likely to affect water cycles very differently in mixed species forests than it is to ash type forests. The initial flush of juvenile foliage that happens after fire and resprouting eucaly eucalypts didn't um, heavily transpire and the subsequent increases in capacity for a leaf to use more water was counted by a reduction in total leaf area. So for a few years after crown removing fires, water use by resprouting mixed species eucalypt forests was little different to the, um, the nearby mature mixed species forests. But because we found that the leaves that um, were produced during the first year after fire um, had a greater respiration rate and a reduced photosynthetic rate, we say that um, successful regeneration may depend on the health of the forest before the fire. So this project was a collaborative one. It was between Mark Adams, Tom Buckley, Ali Barlow, Mana Garuna and myself, and we received expert technical assistance from Michael Kemp throughout the whole time. Thank you. Back to you, Tanya. Sorry. Thank you, Taryn. You're welcome. Look, the thing that strikes me as, as really important about this research is that perhaps before it was done, people tended to take a one-size-fits-all with their understanding of forests and ecosystems and their effect on, on water flows. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of, of considering the type of ecosystem and making sure we have information in Australia and internationally that is locally relevant? Oh, thanks, Tanya. So the main thing is these two forest types um, are equally proportionate in our catchments, and especially in the ones around Melbourne. There's 50% of the catchment is made up of the ash type. 50% is made up of the mixed species forest type. So if you just assume that the mixed species forests responded to fire in the same way as the alpine ash or the mountain ash forests, then your um, calculations of yield could be greatly out. That's the main thing. It's just a tool for land managers. And I guess too, if these are catchments that flow into Melbourne's water supplies, then you want those estimates to be correct in the planning, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll leave it there and to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Taryn. Thanks, Tanya. The next presenter we're going to hear from is Dr. Peter Nyman from the University of Melbourne. Peter is going to present on quantifying the risk to water quality. And again, we encourage the audience to send through their questions through that bottom left dialog box. Take it away, Peter. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so my work here is on um, uh, quantifying uh, risk to water quality uh, as a result of post-fire erosion. Um, 
the work is a collaborative effort between uh, Atel, Gary Sheridan, uh, Rene van der Sant, Phil Moxley, Chris Sherwin, and Patrick Lay, and they've all contributed to that. Uh, in this part of the world over the last decade or so. Um, both the Sydney and the Canberra water supply catchments have been burnt uh, uh, as part of these fires uh, with large impact on water quality. And particularly, uh, the catchments near Canberra uh, were affected quite strongly by, by the wildfire in 2003 with uh, large increases in turbidity and constituents such as uh, iron and manganese. Ultimately, these impacts resulted in um, uh, disruption to the water supply and investment in a new treatment plant at the cost of about $40 million. This graph here that I'm showing in the slide is uh, uh, taken from a study by White et al. Uh, in the Journal of Water uh, Resources Research. And it shows the turbidity in the coastal catchments uh, in a 30 year period between 1975 and 2005. And you can see the big spikes in turbidity following the fire in 2003. It's about a uh, increased by a factor of three or four in turbidity, and I think the manganese and iron increased by a factor of 30. Um, another example of the impact uh, of fire on water quality can be seen in this data from Lake, uh, Lake Glen Maggie uh, in Victoria from a, a wildfire in 2007. So this data actually contains uh, uh, the impact of, of two fires. So the data spans back to uh, 19. Um, 90 and to 2010, and the headwaters of the Lake Limagi were burnt uh, in 1998, just a small part, 17%, and then again in 2007. And the black dot there is the nitrogen, and the clear dot uh, is the total phosphorus content uh, in the water entering Lake Limagi. And you can see there in the in the in the data that's shown that the area burned is really important. So in the 1998 wildfire, there's only or hardly an impact at all, but then in 2007, both nitrogen and phosphorus increased uh, to well above the, the guidelines for uh, water quality uh, in fresh water set by Australia and the UN standards. So, post fire erosion response can be very complex to predict because we have a variable fire severity, different intrinsic catchment properties, and randomness in the type of rainfall events that you see after uh, a burn. So. We need models to try and untangle the effects of all these different variables on risk. Um, and models have applications in different, uh, to different land management questions. So we can, for instance, produce a metric with baseline risk, so the frequency and magnitude of impact. We can also uh, provide a basis for developing risk maps, so using maps to show the relative risk in different parts of the landscape. And also, more sophisticated models can be used to identify the effects of different management interventions. So, for instance, if you're wanting to uh, mitigate the impact of a burn on a hill by um, putting out hay bales, you might be able to use models to see what the effect of those uh, measures might be. And different management questions require different types of models. So, um, and, and, and temporal scale is really critical to understanding how models address different land, land management questions. In this little figure here, you have three different temporal scales. One is um, within an event, the other temporal scale is during a recovery from a burn, so a five-year time frame, and the other scale is a hundred-year time frame. So each of these time frames have different types of parameters that determine what type of erosion, uh, what type of risk you need to predict. So within an event, you're interested in the actual rainfall event and the type and the intensity of that storm in relation to uh, the burn impact. Whereas within a, a recovery uh, period, within a single burn, you're interested in the rate of recovery of attachment in relation to the uh, number and, and severity of storms during that period. So your risk picture becomes more complex. And then over sort of 100 year time scale, then both your fire regime and your rainfall regime are variable. And you need to incorporate more information on the frequency and, and severity of fires as well as the frequency and severity of storms in the landscape in order to determine the risk uh, of water contamination. So in our research, we set out to explore or develop um, models for incorporating these fire and rainfall regime parameters into uh, measures of risk and then follow up with more experimental work to look at how fire severity and aridity act as uh, landscape filters in uh, 
determining how the interaction between fire and rainfall regimes uh, translates to uh, erosion. So this first uh, research outcome is related to the model development. So this is just a, a um, quick summary of, of the type of model that we developed to predict the effects of fire and rainfall regimes on uh, water quality risk. So the blue disks in this figure uh, represents rainstorms, and the red disk represents uh, fire events. And the disks have an area, so a, an x, y direction, and they also have a duration. So for storms, the area is about 10 kilometers squared, and they last for about 30 minutes. For um, the fire events, they have variable areas, and they last for about two years. So we're not interested in the duration of the fire itself, but the duration of the fire impact. And using information on the area and the duration of, of burns and um, storms, we can say something about the expected annual area of intersection. This annual area of intersection is directly proportional to the frequency with which a landscape is primed for a particular erosion response. So uh, and these parameters we can obtain from uh, the Bureau of Meteorology for the rainstorm and then for the size and duration of or size and frequency of um, fires, we can work with the uh, fire history data to obtain those parameters. And as a case study, we used this model to look at the frequency of debris flows um, in Victorian and um, catchment, and in catchment in, in uh, Canberra, near Canberra. And we know that the rainfall thresholds for these large debris flow events, uh, which Terry Sheridan pointed out as being a really important process in the video you saw before, the rainfall threshold for these events is about 35 millimeters per hour. And modeling these rainfall events together with uh, the uh, frequency and size of fires, we can say something about how often we are likely to see these large events occur over long time scales in the landscape. So for current fire regime, uh, the, um, I'm trying to find the pointer here. Here we go. So you see these uh, green lines here are for current fire regime. You can see that for storm event rates representative of Kilmore, north of Melbourne, you'd like to see an event frequency of about 250 to 400 years. And for a more um, intense fire regime or storm regime uh, in northeast of Victoria and near Bright, the more frequent storms mean that means they also have more frequent erosion events. And then we can play around with uh, climate change, for instance, and say, so would we change the part of fires, how is that going to influence the rate at which these events occur in the landscape? So by adjusting the fire frequency for a high climate change scenario, we can see here that your frequency ends up being much higher uh, as a result of more frequent fires. So it reduces by about a half. You get twice as more mm -hmm. frequent storms with, with uh, climate change impact on, on fire regime. Now for um, understanding how these fire and storms actually um, translate to our response in the landscape, we need to know how fire severity affects your response. So to do this, we instrumented some headwater catchments with these tipping buckets and measured surface runoff for wildfire, for prescribed fire catchment, and for unburned catchment to see how the peak discharge uh, is dependent on fire severity. And these are the results. So they're quite clear patterns in terms of how fire severity affects peak discharge. On the y-axis here, you have peak discharge. On the x-axis, you have rain intensity. So as the rain intensity increases, your peak discharge increases. And for wildfire, this dependency is much stronger than it is for prescribed fire and unburned conditions. Um, we use peak discharge as a measure of response because this is directly proportional to the amount of sediment that you're likely to see coming out of these catchments. Next, we're interested in understanding how landscapes um, vary in terms of their sensitivity to fire. And we used aridity as a measure of sensitivity because aridity uh, affects the soil. So for more drier environments, you might see poorer soil formation, soil development, more rocky, more gravelly soils, and therefore more surface runoff after fire. In wetter environments, the, the soils are more productive and we tend to have much more infiltration, which reduces the potential for post-fire erosion. So we set up some plots in different levels of aridity to see how the runoff varies with aridity. We have a very clear trend here in how much runoff is produced for different aridities. So in an ash-type forest, you have runoff production of about 5%. Uh, 
whereas it's almost 30% for dry and mixed species forest in the upper end of the theoretical spectrum. So how, how is this useful for uh, um, management? Well, we're providing information to inform strategic land management decisions by providing a model which will help uh, land managers evaluate the changes in water quality as a result of landscape processes such as climate change, prescribed burning, and rainfall regimes. And our plot here of the average return interval of different um, of the brief flows as a result of, of climate change and it's an example of that. For operational land management applications, we can provide information on the spatial aspects of risk. So where, for instance, uh, is prescribed burning likely to cause uh, risk to water quality, and during a wildfire, where should we focus uh, uh, firefighting efforts to reduce the risk of higher value assets and where, where the risks are higher. So um, this is a, a, an example of these type of risk maps that we produce for the Melbourne Water Catchment this is the upper Yarra, and these red areas are areas that are high, there's a high risk in terms of the propensity for producing debris flows. So in summary, with uh, Develop a model for evaluating the effects of fire and rainfall regimes and erosion frequency. We develop quantitative relations between fire severity, rainfall, and runoff response. And then we have developed this a basis for using aridity as a metric of landscape response to fire. And um, all this information can be used to produce models to inform both operational and strategic aspects of land and fire management. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Now, just while my camera comes back on in a moment, um, I've gathered you can hear my voice. So, ah, here I am. <laughs> We've got a question that's been sent in from Cathy earlier, and, and a reminder to the audience, if you do have some questions for Peter, you can type them in the dialog box at the bottom left of the screen. Cathy has asked, with the uptake of plant growth after a fire, does the water quality improve compared to before the fire within, say, a two-year cycle? So the main effect of plant growth after fire is, one, it stores water. So you have less water uh, actually hitting the surface. It protects the surface from the impact of raindrops. And also it uh, creates more roughness. So once you produce overland flow, um, the plants actually reduce the amount or the velocity of, of, of the flow across the hill slope. So we haven't actually measured uh, the effect of post-fire vegetation on erosion relative to pre-fire uh, erosion, but uh, if the vegetation cover on the ground is very dense compared to what you would see in a pre-fire setting, then it's possible that it might reduce the, um, the, the erosion rate relative to background conditions. Is that an area for future research, do you think? Yeah, I think the, the, the main question that we should be addressing with future research is more around how long it takes for different systems to recover. So, you know, different um, levels of aridity mean different rates of recovery. So dry environments take long to produce that type of vegetation, which prevents erosion, whereas um, wetter environments recover more quick. So actually trying to understand how that recovery varies in the landscape is probably a more of an urgent um, question in terms of, of research needs. And I guess with projections for climate change, that's going to be an increasingly important and difficult thing to study as well. That's right. That's right. So with climate change, you, you both have these you know, changes in rainfall and fire regime superimposed on changes in um, the actual landscape itself. So you have intrinsic catchment properties like soil, vegetation, and feedback with erosion that might change as a result of uh, increased fires. So there's a lot of... Um, complexity there to untangle and um, obtaining the data is very difficult because these processes operate over time scales which uh, are hard to do with experiments uh, over one or two years. Mm, yeah. Well, thank you, Peter. We'll leave it there. Um, it's my great pleasure to now introduce our next speaker. We have Dr. Chris uh, Weston from the University of Melbourne. And at the end of Chris's presentation, he'll be joined by his research colleague, Luba Volkova, for the questions and answers session. Chris is going to be speaking on the topic of forest carbon balance and emissions management. Thank you, Chris. No, thank you, Tanya, and uh, good to be part of this online conference. So our task um, as part of this project was to 
put some numbers on the board for the impact of fire on forest carbon and the emission of some key greenhouse gases. And uh, the background to the project really is that um, there wasn't very much known in terms of the impact of either planned burn, and indeed there's not much known about the impact of wildfire or unplanned burn on the carbon balance of forests uh, in the short term or over the long term. So our aim was to measure the immediate impact uh, of prescribed burning on carbon balance across a range of open forests in which we typically apply planned burning uh, operations. And we attempted to cover a range of burn conditions. Our uh, second aim was then to apply this knowledge to develop a better knowledge base uh, to enable uh, end user agencies uh, to both model the immediate consequences of prescribed burning uh, on carbon and greenhouse gases, but also to consider the development in a policy context of um, the importance of planned burning overall in uh, minimising the uh, impact uh, of burning, uh, unplanned burning in forest landscapes. So a little bit about the background to the study. Um, we know that the weather is getting uh, warmer and we know that there are more extreme uh, fire danger days uh, predicted to come in the near future. Indeed, they've probably already arrived in the last decade or so. Uh, across much of southeastern Australia, there have been uh, three large megafires or three megafires in the last uh, 10 to 12 years. And just simple back of the envelope calculations show us that uh, emissions from these megafires in the southeast have contributed or could possibly have contributed to 10% of Australia's annual national emissions. So what this means is that a small change in the forest carbon stocks uh, across Australia can lead to large impacts in terms of our annual emissions uh, reporting. So to improve knowledge in this area, we set out to uh, improve this database of all carbon pools that are potentially affected by fire. And our aim really was to uh, follow along and, and do a, a similar type of job as that to that which has been done for the top end of Australia, where there's been a concerted effort to look at the impact of fire on uh, forest emissions in the uh, trees over grass systems in the north. Our approach uh, was a relatively simple one. We aimed to do field-based measurements of forest carbon before and after fire and to try to cover a wide range of forests uh, across the southeast from southern Queensland through to some fairly dry and uh, low productivity forests in South Australia and also in coastal Tasmania, as well as some medium to reasonably high productivity forests in the wetter parts of the moist lowland forests of Victoria. Over the life of the project, uh, quite a few plots were measured and we interacted with a broad range of agencies and uh, along the way we managed to transfer the knowledge of measuring forest carbon to uh, over 40 or so staff who were essential in completing the project. So we thank the staff from the many agencies that participated. We've tried to summarise uh, the distribution of forest carbon in just one slide um, to uh, convey to the audience that our knowledge of forest carbon up to this point has mostly been that which is in the stems of trees which are of interest in the harvesting and merchantable timber operations in forests. This makes up most of forest, forest carbon above ground between 60 to 80 percent of carbon in the forest is not accessible by fire uh, and resides in the stems of trees that are resistant even to uh, some of the more intense fires that are typical in uh, wildfire situations. Our aim really was to, uh, to put numbers on the amount of carbon that is cont contained in the, uh, the ground flora, sorry, the ground layer, the litter and the coarse woody debris of the forest floor, as well as the uh, near ground uh, fuels that uh, comprise the ground cover and the understory. So you can see from this slide here that across the uh, broad range of forests that we looked at, and we've summarised them here by, by states, that uh, on average above ground forest carbon is around about 165 megagrams of carbon per hectare. Uh, most of this, as you can see, resides in the overstory. And uh, we've also accounted in this slide to carbon down to 30, uh, 30 centimetres depth. 
And largely it's the understory, the ground cover, uh, the dead wood of snags and coarse woody debris and the litter which is impacted by fire. Soil carbon uh, is not impacted by planned fire to any great extent and uh, it's really only in wildfire situations that uh, surface soil carbon becomes uh, a concern in terms of losses. So we're now in a position where we can advise the agencies of the typical uh, typical range of carbon losses that they can expect from planned, planned burning operations in open forest. Here, you, here we see that the average loss of above ground carbon from planned fire is around about 7 megagrams of carbon per hectare, uh, equivalent to uh, somewhere around uh, 3 to 5 percent of the total carbon in the forest. You can see the range there uh, extended from 3 to 11 megagrams of carbon per hectare. Uh, we uh, also, in an attempt to, or in, in our uh, future plans to model carbon losses at a landscape scale, uh, we were interested in relationships between forest uh, productivity and carbon losses, and we now know that carbon losses decrease uh, uh, as a percent of above ground biomass as forest productivity increases. And we can use these relationships in the future. Uh, we know that carbon losses increase with fire intensity, which uh, is uh, a reasonable uh, conclusion. Uh, however, we're able to, to put some numbers around the impact now of the difference between planned and wildfire on some of the key fuel losses. For example, litter, which is, uh, generally averages around about 67% loss in a planned fire, uh, it increases to 90% loss in a, uh, in a wildfire. Uh, coarse woody debris uh, is activated in particular uh, by uh, wildfire conditions and one of the um, uh, key outcomes from this project was to put some, uh, some numbers around the coarse woody debris losses from planned burning in the range of forests that we looked at. And dead standing, uh, dead standing trees also become far more uh, of a source of carbon loss as fire intensity increases from planned burn situations through to uh, the typically very intense uh, con uh, fire conditions of wildfires. We uh, are able to advise the agencies of some fairly straightforward measures to uh, reduce or minimise carbon losses uh, and emissions from planned burning. These include protecting the significant amount of, uh, potentially uh, significant amount of carbon loss Potentially, carbon, potentially significant amount of carbon loss from coarse woody debris and standing, standing dead trees uh, can be minimised by raking around them prior to, uh, prior to burning, planned burning operations, especially if the forest area contains uh, large coarse woody debris pieces, then these could be targeted for uh, mitigation action. Other actions to decrease, decrease carbon emissions include burning when the uh, the little layer of the forest is uh, reasonably dry on top, perhaps around 10%, but more moist uh, uh, underneath, closer to the soil surface. And we also established that it's important to account uh, for loss from all carbon pools and emission estimates. Um, currently, at a, at a national level, or Australia's international reporting of uh, fire losses from fire emission losses from forests is based on an estimate of fine fuels only, but we now know that it's important to account for uh, coarse fuels as well to uh, provide a more complete picture of carbon losses and emissions. And in ongoing efforts to improve Australia's uh, emissions estimates from um, burning in forests, we now, now know that it's important to stratify the emissions by fuel type, and we've got a strong basis now to separate forest fuels into fine and coarse components uh, to do this and to ascribe uh, emissions factors to each of those to more accurately reflect the true emissions resulting. And finally, uh, perhaps in a more detailed area of the research that we looked at, we know that there is a significant amount of carbon redistributed in the forest uh, during burning operations and in terms of uh, forest floor carbon, depending on the intensity of fire, uh, long-lived carbon or char, char carbon or char production, uh, char is either uh, created or, or, 
or destroyed by fire and as the, as the fire becomes far more intense then char production is decreased and you actually get a loss from the char carbon pool. So in this context plant burning um, is a far more um, beneficial outcome in terms of carbon storage um, than the intense wildfires that can lead to loss of carbon from this pool. So I think I'll leave it there um, and uh, open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And we're now getting Chris to move over a little bit so that we can welcome Luba to join him for questions and answers. Hi there, Luba. <laughs> Thanks Hello. for joining us. Peter Marie has sent through a question. How should fire intensity be reduced in prescribed burns to minimise carbon losses? Okay, so um, if planned burning um, results in a mosaic of burnt and unburnt patches on the forest floor uh, and throughout the forest area treated. So uh, at least in the state of Victoria, the idea is to go for a fairly low intensity planned burn to burn off the uh, more readily combusted fine fuels uh, and a component of the ground cover and uh, near surface understory. Um, and losses can be minimised through this approach or can be further minimised through this approach by, uh, as, I, as mentioned during uh, uh, the discussion, by raking around especially some of the larger coarse woody debris or perhaps standing dead trees uh, on the site treated. I think it's more about uh, fine fuel moisture if we talking strictly about fine intensity because uh, fine intensity influenced by fine fuel moisture and I think all land managers actually can only burn under specific moisture conditions between 15 to 10 percent so when we reach in 10 and, and, and lower fuel moisture then fine intensity increases therefore simple answer fine density can be reduced in prescribed burning if you burn under optimal fuel moisture conditions. And is that something that's difficult or easy to, to monitor, to check? Well, that's what the land managers do anyway, and I think Adam would be the best person to answer because he is a land manager who is doing this as everyday job. But yeah, they do it pretty, pretty accurately. Now they have little good machines they can carry in, in the bush and monitor when the fuel uh, reaches some optimal moisture level to, to start their burn. Well, we might revisit that with Adam when we hear from him shortly. Um, Peter, all the way from Italy, has sent through a question earlier. Um, what practical consequences does the investigation have for landscape management in general? I think in a broad context, we know that we can apply planned fire um, and know the carbon and greenhouse gas emissions consequences of the fire that we apply. And that's very important when it comes to uh, the application of fire in an environment where uh, the climate is changing and where the risk of large and uncontrolled fires uh, is increasing. So uh, we've just outlined some of the practical measures which can be used to, um, to minimise carbon, carbon losses and emissions during plan burning. As this knowledge can be applied in a strategic and uh, a management context over longer periods of time. To, to justify planned burning rather than uh, allow the forest uh, to experience a higher risk of wildfire. Do you have anything to add to that, Luba? Well, I think question was about what's the practicality of this research mm. and uh, what we want to highlight is that now we can very accurately estimate impact of fire wildfire and prescribed fire on carbon and emission only because we start accounting for char production and for different fuels and we can see that it's actually affecting land managers negatively because wildfire uh, now at the uh, how would say this <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've provided the evidence for for um, uh, mitigating potential of plant fire over wildfire because of accounting for charcoal and for uh, accounting for contribution of coarser fuels into the fire overall fire. 
mm. I think that's one of the practical outcomes and most it's important in important. research. Mm. Well, thank you. We might leave the questions there. Now, we've now heard from all of our um, research presenters. Before we hear from our lead end user, we're just going to run a quick poll to gauge an understanding of how you, the audience, might use the research and information you've heard from today. So we're asking you to give us your general feedback rather than making formal commitments. Just let us know, and you can answer more than one choice in this poll. In which ways could you begin to use what you've heard today? One, share and discuss this with colleagues and stakeholders. Two, use the findings to inform policy and practice in my organisation. Three, advocate for more research resources such as funding for your organisation. And four, learn more about how I can apply this work to my role. And we'll give it a few more seconds. And we'll leave that there. Thank you. And it's interesting to see, them, to see the mix of the ways of using that information, both internally amongst an organisation and externally amongst stakeholders as well. It's always good to see how these things can be applied. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Leavesley. He's our lead end user today. He's from ACT Parks and Conservation Service. And Adam's going to discuss in general terms his position and the perspective that he brings to today's research and, and Adam, generally what are your impressions of what you've heard about today and how they can be applied? Uh, thanks Tanya. Um, at, representing the lead end users, we're extremely happy with, with the um, process that, that uh, we went through in getting to this position and really happy with the outcome of the research. Uh, I've been involved with the CRC from near to the outset as a student in, in the beginning. And one of the things that was evident um, in, in the beginning was that there was quite a tension between the need for sort of novelty and, and innovation amongst the researchers and, and some of the industry expectations about what was, what was possible. And, and I think through the time of the CRC, there's, there's been um, an adjustment in the expectations of the end users and, and greater accommodation of the needs of industry amongst the researchers. So we get to the end of a project like this and we've got a range of, of, of outcomes that, that are extremely uh, good, extremely useful and it will make a great deal of difference to, to the industry, especially in the southeast of Australia. Um, the, uh, the story in relation to mixed forests um, and the, the amount of water yield following fire it is extremely important for us in the ACT and for other parts of Australia because um, <clears throat> in the ACT the ash type forests are perhaps uh, less than 10% of the land area. So if, if you were assuming of, of the catchment, so if you're assuming that the water supply that was coming from them was the same as the mixed forests, you'd, you'd be making big, big mistakes. So although they hadn't, they hadn't been studied at all in the past and we've got a much greater understanding over the southeast of how we expect um, water supply to change following fires over a much larger area. Uh, the, the study that uh, Peter Nyman did uh, looking at erosion um, following fires, um, that's really important for the industry. We've initiated a research utilisation project via AFAC and we're trying to develop guidelines for managing um, fire and erosion that will be applicable right across all the agencies. Uh, all the AFAC agencies, that's Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the carbon research that uh, Luba and, and Chris did, uh, that's also extremely important. It's a, a, you know, a key issue um, in, in, in Australia and, and all over the world. If we had have found that um, planned burning was, was having a, a, a really strong impact on um, the amount of carbon that was being released into the atmosphere, then we, you know, that, that would have been something that we would have had to take into account of. But the results that they came up with suggest that the burning programs uh, potentially are going, can be used in a way that, that will be positive in relation to carbon. So that, that's a, a really important finding, finding for us. Um, in a nutshell, um, we understand a, a lot more now the consequences of putting planned fire into the landscape and, uh, and that's an excellent position to be in. Um, what I'd also like to say um, 
is that uh, my boss here at ACT Parks, Neil Cooper, and, uh, and Dr Tina Bell from Sydney University put a lot of work into administering this program, that dirty work no one wants to do behind the desk, accounting for funding and, and all that kind of thing, and they really should be given a big pat on the back and thank you for getting the project to where it got to today. Ah, credit where credit is due. Thanks, Adam. Um, what changes do you think need to occur within the fire and emergency management sector to take up the findings into policy and practice? Um, that's a, a really interesting question. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a really important improvement was the thing I spoke about first of all, that, um, that we've managed to bring the researchers in the industry a bit closer together at the outset of this project. So that the things that people have been studying in this case are high priority for, for the industry. We want to know about it. Um, and, and, uh, and we've still got to, well, well the research utilisation project, that's things that we're, we're still learning about how we can best do that, how we can um, put it in, bring it into the manuals, bring it into policy, bring it into changing the most appropriate ways that we can do that. Um, but it's part of the learning. Not only do we need new knowledge, but we need uh, new research, but we need also to develop new systems within the industry to, to, best, to best use it. But I, I, think, I think a key uh, change that, that we've seen through the period of, of CRC, you know, we, we love our jobs. We do stuff that um, people pay to do as, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, there's, I've no trouble getting a car. The cars are all parked out here and I can go driving in the bush behind the locked gate. You know, we get helicopters and we have a great time, but the point is that, that that's not necessarily going to be the thing which leads to improvements in bushfire management. And I think through, over the period of the CRC, people have come to learn that we need to look at new ways, this new information and new ways of confronting the issue, sometimes not as um, fun on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but that a lot of the outcomes are going to relate to that sort of planning and, and understanding the landscape and spatial analysis and all those sort of things which allow us to do a better job. So I think that's the key. It's happening and, and we're going to only see better outcomes as time goes by. That's an important point to make. Thank you for that, Adam. Uh, we did have a question sent in from Alan. Um, he's asked, why would there be a difference between planned and unplanned fires in water quality and quantity in catchment forests? Well, that's a good question. There's, there's two, um, essentially there's two reasons. But first of all, um, well, I should say that, that what burns in a fire <coughs> is, is material that was alive or used to be alive. And when you get a really hot fire, it's actually shocking to see um, trees that have survived the fire growing out of gravel, all the soil, has disappeared, all the grass and the things you thought would have, would have burnt have all disappeared, there's no leaves on the trees but there can be no soil as well. And you, get a, you, can, get a, you can get a massive change, you get changes in the vegetation removed and the soil chemistry and so, you, and, 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 and so there's, not, there's no comparison between the, the fire severity in some of those really hot fires and, and what we can achieve during a planned burn. And, and, and then there's, two, there's another aspect of that as well. When, when we're planning a fire, <coughs> we, we don't burn it as, uh, as intensely. We can also light it in places that prevent um, areas that might be prone to erosion from, from being impacted. And we can light it at times during a season, seeing the, um, the, the fuel moisture gradient across the landscape to to try to make sure that we're only impacting areas where the effects on water quality and erosion uh, will be minimised. Mm, which brings in the, the, the research that Chris and Luba were talking about as well. Look, that's all we've got time for. Thank you for that, Adam. Um, before we finish off today's proceedings, we're going to revisit our earlier poll just to see how our knowledge and our understanding of these issues has changed. So tell us, how much do you think you understand now about the impact of fire on water and carbon? Oh, it's concerning that someone said nothing, given that no one said nothing earlier when we re revisited it. <laughs> 
we'll leave it there. We are delighted to see the bulk of the bell curve move towards the bottom, which hopefully means that we've all learnt a little bit of something today. I'll now invite all of today's presenters back to the screen so that we can hear from them before we finish off. And just hearing from the presenters in order that they presented today, just give us your final concluding remarks, a, a thought for us to take home today from the, the proceedings. Taryn, we'll start with you. Thanks, Tanya. So I think from our work, um, we need to understand how water is used by vegetation in forested catchments and how this is influenced by events such as fire. So our research adds to the knowledge base of just how different forest types use water and it shows that mixed species forests use water in a completely different pattern to ash type forests and that was something that was unknown before we started this project. Thank you. And Peter? Well I guess sort of one of the outcomes is unfortunately that we've seen how complex these processes are and that um, you know, the transient nature of fire effects and the randomness in rainfall and uh, variability in intrinsic uh, catchment properties means that data alone will sort of never be able to capture the full spectrum of risk that we'll see in the landscape. Um, so the challenge, I guess, is therefore to develop uh, models that are based on a general concepts and having a model framework that aligns with some of the key questions that are being asked uh, by the land managers. Um, and also having models that are, are built around general sort of principles and laws which are transferable for one location to another and that way maximizing the flexibility and usefulness of type specific research and to improve the way in which we manage risk and prioritize research so across the landscape. Thank you, Peta. Uh, who would like to go first? Chris or Luba? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Always a difficult one. We we think our research uh, points to the need for an improved um, knowledge of fuels and of the types of fuels in forests and the need for land managers to, to have a good monitoring database that is maintained through time and updates fuel loads as climates change and as burns occur so that when fires do occur we're in a good position to know how to, how to deal with them in a uh, uh, in a behavioural sense, but also some of the emissions consequences of the, of burning. Mm. And Luba? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and another point which Chris was making is about importance of accounting for char production because it's a long-term carbon storage, and once it's not accounted for, we assume that all that carbon is gone to the atmosphere while it sits on the ground. So it's a 30 to 40 percent of estimation of uh, emissions rather than what happens in reality. Mm, so more robust carbon accounting that, that accounts for the char as well. It is important. For all, for all fuels, yes. Yeah. So mm. Not just stick to one fine fuel, but yeah, robust accounting for carbon. Mm. And of course, Adam, the lead end user gets the last say. Um. <clears throat> We think that the key, one of the key learnings from the point of view of, of trying to get research that you can use in this sort of partnership is that you work as hard as possible to get to know the researchers to help them to understand your business and, and to bring everybody together um, because that has led to the sort of results that we've got out of this project and, and we've been very happy with. Going, going forward in the future, I think we've still got more that we can do in terms of research utilisation um, and that's, that, that's the sort of window, that's the space where um, this kind of project can be further improved again. Thank you, Adam. Well, that brings today's forum to a close. I'd like to finish by thanking today's presenters, Taryn, Petta, Chris, Luba and Adam, and also to you, the audience, for your participation and your questions. We encourage you to visit the Bushfire CRC website at www.bushfirecrc.com. We do hope it will be in online very soon. In the coming days, we'll make today's presentations and video available, and there'll also be fire notes on the website that relate to today's research that we've discussed. We do encourage you to invite your colleagues to watch and, and see this information at a later date if you feel that they would have benefited from seeing today's proceedings.
We know we've gone a little bit over time, but if you do have a couple of spare minutes, we would really appreciate you staying online for a brief exit survey. If you could tell us uh, a little bit of feedback, then we can use that to improve future research forums. Our next webinar forum will be Awake, Smoky and Hot, and that is going to take place on Monday, September the 22nd. Keep an eye on the Bushfire CRC website for details or leave a comment in the exit survey if you'd like to be included in the mailing list for future events. On behalf of the Bushfire CRC Research to Drive Change project and its partners, thanks for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you next time.